Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I was enjoying a video by Simon Dan this morning where he was debunking Dee Marble on the Earthrise photograph from Apollo 11. Now, it was a very amusing video and I think you'll enjoy it. So the link to it's in the description. Stop by Simon Dan's channel and have a look at him demolish Dee Marble once again. Now, one of the things that came up in Simon Dan's video was tidal locking of the moon. It was mentioned several times, but Simon didn't go into it very much, so I thought I'd make this video as a companion to Simon Dan's video and explain tidal locking of the moon. So cue up the music, and let's go. Now to understand how the moon became tidally locked to the Earth, we have to understand first what tidally locked means. Tidal locking means that the day and the year of the moon in its orbit around the Earth is exactly the same. The same face of the moon always faces the Earth. Now the opposite side of the moon, which we call the dark side, always faces away from the Earth. So now that we know what tidal locking is, let's understand why it occurs. It's actually not that difficult to understand. The moon is held to the Earth by gravity. Now to understand why the moon became tidally locked to the Earth, we have to understand something about gravity. We have gravity attracting the mass of the Earth to the Moon and the mass of the Moon to the Earth. It forms a line of gravitational attraction between the two. This line is not anchored at the center of the Earth and the center of the Moon. Those anchor points are moved inward a little bit and a little closer together. And as a result of this, the Earth and the Moon actually wobble around the orbit. So if you were to imagine this pen is that line of gravity, it doesn't wobble back and forth like a clock pendulum. It actually wobbles more like this. Because this center of gravity is about a thousand miles under the surface of the Earth. Now another thing that we need to consider is that the gravitational attraction of the front half of the Moon facing the Earth is larger than the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon for the back half of the Moon. And as a result, the Moon becomes a little elongated, something like this. Because just as the front half of the Moon is more strongly attracted to the mass of the Earth than the back half of the Moon, likewise, the front half of the Earth is more strongly attracted to the Moon than the back half is. This causes both bodies to be somewhat elongated. Now the process of tidal locking is related to this elongation of the Moon. For example, in order to elongate like that, the substance of the Moon has to actually flatten out at the poles and stretch out a little bit at the equator. Now the problem that you run into is as the Moon continues to rotate on its own axis, this oval shape is pulled away from the line connecting it to the Earth. And here's what I'm talking about. You see you have kind of an oval-shaped Earth and an oval-shaped Moon. They're connected with this red line, which is the line of gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon. Now, as the Moon rotates, that line is pulled slightly off-center. You see how the oval of the Moon is no longer directly lined up with the red Earth-Moon line? Now because of this offset, two interesting things occur. First of all, if the Moon was lined up directly with the Earth, all of the gravitational attraction between the two would be devoted to holding the Moon next to the Earth. However, as that Moon axis is tilted a little bit off, part of the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon is directed to pull that line back towards the red line. First, because the Earth is trying to pull that yellow line back to alignment with the red line, that is actually opposing the rotation of the Moon slightly. That causes the rotation of the Moon to slightly slow down. And since it's a continuous drag, over time, it will slow it down and eventually stop it. Now the second implication of this 
is since part of the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon is devoted not to holding the Earth to the Moon, to bring that yellow line back into alignment with the red line, that means that the Moon is less strongly held to the Earth. As a result, it drifts away a little bit, and its orbit slows down a little. So, the effect of gravity on the Moon is, one, to slow its rotation, and two, to increase the radius of its orbit. Now, the result of this over time means that the Moon becomes tidally locked to the Earth, which means that the same face of the Moon is always pointing at the Earth. Now, if you were to stand on the side of the Moon that is facing us and look up at the Earth, the Earth would always be in the same point in the sky. Now, an interesting effect of this is the same thing is actually happening on the Earth due to the gravitational attraction of the Moon. The Earth is very slowly slowing down. And in several million years' time, we may have a situation where only one face of the Earth faces the Moon. So it may be kind of interesting as we talk about the man and the moon today, future settlers on the moon at bases may refer to the cat in the earth based on the appearance of the one side of the earth that always faces the moon. Now to add another thing is that many of the bodies that we see in the solar system are tidally locked to each other. This includes a number of the moons of the gas giants, Pluto, and the moons of Mars. Now it can happen to planets as well. Now, there are no tidally locked planets in our solar system. However, if you look at Mercury, which is closest to the Sun, Mercury rotates three times on its axis for every two orbits around the Sun. So it's very nearly tidally locked, but not quite there yet. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's something that I'd like to do uh, going forward in the future. For the last year, I've done a lot of debunking of Flat Earth channels, and I noticed a problem with that. First, it gives the Flat Earthers the attention that they crave and need to exist as a movement. And second, it gives them views. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to approach it from the other side. I'm going to look at the debunkers. I'm going to look at Simon Dan and Conspiracy Cats and Red's Rhetoric and Team Skeptic. And the reason for this is twofold. One, I'd like to promote their channels a little bit and send a few of my Team Bob players over there. And two, I think that a lot of times when they do their debunks, they really cover the subject well, but there may be one or two things that need to be expanded on, and I can act as kind of the expansion for their presentation. This isn't going to be my exclusive job on my channel. I'll continue to do a lot of my own work, but I think a lot of debunking videos sometimes need a little extra explaining on a particular subject that was addressed but not emphasized in the original video. So, this is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for your support of the channel and for stopping by today. Hit that little like, subscribe, and the bell icon down in the corner, and I'll see you again soon. Take care.